singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, my guest on the show is Tracy Atkins. Tracy is not only an occasional contributor with some of the very po- most popular articles on singularityweblog.com, actually, but also he is the author of a very interesting book called Eternum Ray, which came out of publishing just today. So, hot off the press. Um, Hi, Tracy, and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Hey, Nick. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Tracy, and I'm I'm also very happy to have you on the show because uh, last Friday I actually finished your book here, um, and I have to say I enjoyed it. So um, your interview would be the second one of a series of of an interviews that I'm doing. The first one was with Marco Santini, trying to highlight some new science fiction writers that are think that that I believe are worth uh, more attention and uh, whose books are worth reading. I think. So let me start the interview today with a little um, quote from the very introduction of your book. So at the introduction you say, sophisticated software suites are already outthinking human minds and are beginning to reason. Computers can now understand natural human language and speak in kind. The autonomous self-improving computer system is on the horizon. The convergence of these concepts will soon give birth to true artificial intelligence and ignite technological singularity. This is the point when the slow river of human advancement breaks into an unstoppable waterfall of discovery and knowledge. So I have to say I really like that uh, introduction and and I like your definition of the singularity. So I'd like you to um, elaborate a little bit on that if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When it comes to the singularity and concepts of um, exponential growth of technology, you know, we often look at uh, some of the various graphs where you show a slow uptick in technology, then you see the knee of the curve, and then you really see the exponential growth take off. Well, if you flip that around, it looks actually much like a waterfall. You've got the ever, <laughs> ever accelerating pace. You get more advancement, more advancement, and then that knee of the curve is kind of the point where the water breaks over the edge. And it, it's a, I think it's a fairly good analogy um, for what's about to happen. Um, you know, we've got advancement for the last, what, 10,000 years technology-wise. I mean, you know, moving up through the Bronze Age and right on through. It's been pretty slow. And then, you know, last 100 years, it's been really breathtaking. So, You know, as a Canadian, I have to say, though, in Canada, we usually call that a hockey stick. <laughs> a hockey stick. <laughs> I could definitely see that. At least to Canadianize the, 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 the technological singularity graph, the exponentially growing graph, lo- looks like a hockey stick to us. It does. It does. Well, <laughs> you, to use another Canadian landmark, uh, Niagara Falls would be a good uh, analogy. Uh, That's actually a, another good point. Very interesting. So, so tell, uh, Tracy, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background, but especially why and how you got interested in the technological singularity in general, and then why and how did you, got in, did you get interested in writing science fiction novel about the technological singularity in particular? Well, I've always been into technology uh, um, since I was a young guy. I guess uh, 10 years old, I got my uh, first PC. It was a 386, so I'll uh, date myself there. But... Um, I've always been really intrigued with computers and technology, and um, I don't know, it seems to always have been a fit. I made a uh, career out of it. Uh, you know, I've got going on you know, 20 years in the tech industry. Uh, started off doing uh, system engineering, uh, some network engineering. Now I'm into uh, software. So, you know, I've always had that techie background. But for science fiction, uh, some of my earliest memories actually are of. Uh, sitting around the console TV watching uh, the original Star Trek uh, with my family. And, uh, you know, they were real uh, enthusiastic about space and exploration and where technology can take us. And 
of course, you know, I was speeding that up as a kid. So, uh, you know, Star Trek was a big part of that. Uh, as I got a little older, I kind of ate up any science fiction I could get into. So, um, if you start to think about the singularity as a concept and, uh, you know, it's all brought about through technology and advancement, it, it seemed like, uh, a really good marriage of two different uh, concepts for me. So, you know, I've always enjoyed uh, writing. Um, you know, I uh, took some college writing courses, and I really liked those and had a lot of fun with it. And, and uh, so, you know, I've been churning over some ideas to maybe write a book um, you know, over the last few years, started to get some ideas in my head. Um, I really started to think about uh, cell phone technology. Actually, it was kind of a, a thing I like to think about where, where we're kind of going with it. You know, I've seen the advancement kind of go from the flip phones to, uh, you know, the smartphones we've got now, seeing little earpieces in people's ears, you know, real neat cyborg type stuff, and started to kind of ponder where that would go. Well, in the middle of all that, I uh, just by chance uh, happened upon uh, – the um, Transcendent Man documentary. It was Ray Kurzweil documentary, and uh, actually, the, the the Ray Kurzweil documentary is the singularity is near. That's Barry Ptolemy's documentary yeah. about uh, Ray Kurzweil, who, by right. the way, for those who don't know, is is another person that I have interviewed just right after the the movie came out. Oh, excellent! Yeah, I haven't got to check that one out. I'll definitely have to do that. So, yeah, that. Uh, that really changed my way of thinking. I mean, I uh, I really enjoyed Kurzweil's optimism, uh, uh, you know, his view that we can overcome all these things, the ideas that, uh, you know, technology will accelerate. So it, it really steered my entire train of thought and uh, direction. Uh, it was a grand piece of inspiration. And uh, I started reading and researching as much as I could, and uh, I just knew that when I wrote my novel and sat down and started, that's... That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to write singularity fiction and uh, mm-hmm. led the book. Now, now, before we, we talk a little bit more about your novel, let me just grab one of the things that you said here about watching Star Trek because it's very funny how on one of the articles that you wrote for Singularity Weblog called Artificial Intelligent and Completely Uninterested in You, yeah. uh, somebody wrote a fantastic comment saying, Tracy... He, uh, that's actually a comment by Terry May two days ago. He wrote, Tracy, exactly how did you get into science fiction? Was it from watching stars as a child or Star Trek and Star Wars? I'm very interested to know who your influence was in your childhood that made, made you love the world of AI, to question the norm, to look at things in the abstract. Your excerpts from the novel are truly fantastic, and I'm quite sure that your parents, and especially your biological mom, is at the top of your list of influencers in the science fiction aspect of you. What do you want to say to that? (laughs) I want to say yes. I've had some very, uh, very good family influences. Um, You know, I grew up in a home that that really marveled at science and technology. You know, I mean, we would take uh, a field trip to the... uh, Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, which is uh, about an hour and a half, two hours from where I grew up, you know, to go look at the uh, radio telescopes, to check out the Science Center, um, you know. We weren't big on uh, network TV. It was more National Geographic and, uh, you know, trying to learn things and discover things. I mean, all those things were major influences. And, you know, of course, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, and all the other major uh, science fiction shows were um, inter Produced to me at a young age, so I guess all that kind of culminates together to form who you are, and it, it shows through in the things you do in life later on when you're young. You know, <laughs> that's that's really very interesting, and it's funny how the person got that you have been influenced also by Star Trek. That's <laughs> I, I think that's absolutely amazing, actually. Um, but let's let's move on and, and uh, talk a little bit more about the book. So. What's the title of the book all about, Eternum Ray? <clears throat> well, Eternum Ray is a combination of um, two of the key concepts in the book. Um, Eternum, yes, <laughs> right there. Uh, Eternum is the computer network uh, that is developed uh, basically to allow human beings to transcend biology. So Eternum is a uh, accused of the Latin word eternal, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, Ray is the uh, 
title character that is the AI or the artificial super intelligence. Uh, Ray is actually short for Ray of Light. Uh, the hardware platform was Blue Light uh, in the book. So now you do say that that comes from Ray of Light, but was there no homage paid to Ray Kurzweil in some oh, way indirectly? <coughs> Absolutely there is. Um, <clears throat> I hold the man in very high regard. So, um, you know, I don't want to uh, impose on him, uh, but I definitely do pay homage to him. And uh, it's it's definitely a nod of thank you and appreciation. So so let's move on and, and get a little bit deeper into the book itself. So uh, what's the what's this story all about? What's the novel all about? Well, to sum it up, <clears throat> it's a science fiction novel that takes place in the far future, uh, uh, the year 2216, which is, is quite far ahead. And it's several hundred years after the singularity occurs on Earth. And it's told from the story of a man who was actually born way back in 1979. And, um, you know, it's a family man, every bit, uh, average white-collar worker, work with technology, uh, kind of write, uh, write what you know, right? And uh, the story basically picks up where he's trying to capture his life in a series of letters uh, to write to his son. So he sits down, and over the course of several months, he writes letters just kind of chronicling his life, kind of the highlights of it. Um, you know, he's into technology, technology. Uh, so he's kind of pointing out some of the things that influenced him. He's looking at um, all the advancements that's happened, kind of where humanity's went, and his life experiences in that, what's enriched his life, the things that he's uh, he wants to kind of pass on to his son as the, the better parts of humanity. And, you know, still talk about some of the, the negative and the bad things, too. Um, so really the novel's uh, sort of a singularity memoir, in a way, that, that chronicles the whole progression all the way out for several uh, several hundred years. So that, in a nutshell, is the novel. I like that singularity memoir. It's a uh, it's a very interesting format. How you go sort of start at twenty twenty sixteen or twenty two sixteen or so, and then you go backwards a couple hundred years and begin again forward. Uh, why did you pick up that format, and especially sort of telling it as a as a letter format rather than you know, as, as a story unfolding in front of our eyes. So why choose that particular format? That's a really good question. Um, the format's uh, called the epistolary uh, tradition. Basically, it's it's been around for about 400 years as a literary method. Um, some classic books like Flowers for Algernon or uh, Frankenstein is written in the letter or document format. So taking that concept, I really enjoy the fact that you're telling it from a first-person point of view, and coming from a form of documents, you can add realism uh, to what you write. So um, it's kind of, um, kind of a documentary style in a way. Uh, you get that, that personal, in-depth view right into a subject or topic. So it lets you cover a lot of ground really quickly. You know, to cover 200 grounds in uh, a dialogue format with back and forth, I mean, you know, it would probably take two or three books worth to cover that kind of ground. So I'm able to, to cover a longer timeline, yet get you that really personal, intimate look at one person's life through the whole thing. So you do kind of get a focus in on one person's experience, and you can talk about some of the broader points, but, um, you know, it, it still allows you to get that, that realism and that, that granularity. So when you're reading it, my hope is that you'll get pulled right into the page, and you can follow along the entire story in a lot of detail. So, And, and I, I would say it, it actually works very well because, um, you know, um, as a young sort of a new science fiction writer, I, I didn't expect to be treated in such a nice way while I was reading the book. I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did. So okay. I think you succeeded in that. That's how I praise. I appreciate that very much. Um, so let me ask you this. Have your ideas and perception of artificial intelligence and the technological singularity evolved in any way since you actually finished writing Eternum Ray? I or during the process of writing and towards the end of the book or after the book? Well, uh, during the writing, of course, um, the further I got along into it, the more think, thought you have to put into it. You really have to kind of think about some of the points. Um, 
the technology part of it, um, you know, I've got a background in technology, so kind of understanding that or thinking through that part uh, wasn't quite as in depth as having to think about the social ramifications, uh, relationships, society. Um, there was a lot put into that. I did a lot of research. Um, you know, as I was writing a book, after I wrote the book even, and uh, I continue to have a pretty big appetite for uh, for reading, especially uh, technical papers. You know, your website is, is a great example of some of the information out there. So I wouldn't say it's my views have changed, but they've definitely been enriched and broadened, and uh, there's a lot more depth um, to understanding. I, I haven't changed my stance on optimism. Mm-hmm. If anything, I've found more cases to support an optimistic view than a pessimistic view of the future. So. Yeah, I want to come back to the uh, topic of optimism in a little bit. But uh, right now I want to ask you, so you, you've mentioned that you've done a lot of research for the book, and, and that's clearly visible, I, I believe, for anyone who actually reads through the book. Uh, so how much of it is, is sort of science and how much of it is science fiction? Well, that's another great question. Uh, for the book, I try to build a logical case for a lot of the technology that you see in the book. So from a technological standpoint, um, a technology is developed, and then you know, a new technology gets built upon that. So it's, it's more of a rational or logical way you know, we progress through technology in the book. Now, that's not to say that any of that will come to fruition. I mean, there's so many infinite variables you know, between now and 100 years, it's impossible to accurately predict um, any kind of a future technology. I think you can take some of the trends that you see now and um, kind of get an idea of a direction maybe, um, but to make an actual you know, prediction. So in, the, in that regard, I mean, it is science fiction through and through. I mean, you know, the bulk of the story picks up in the 2040s, um, so you know, a lot of that technology is, uh, uh, I guess, make-believe, but... Um, yeah, you, you, for example, uh, since you've mentioned the 2040s, let me, let me catch that thought right there. On page 25 of the book, you say that by 2042, the population of the world has tripled, but only one-third was biological in nature. So mm-hmm. let me ask you this. Is the future of humanity synthetic, in your opinion, or, or, or uh, digital? I think that we gravitate toward creating things ourselves, and we have a very keen interest in creating um, non-biological life, artificial intelligence, um, even if it's weak AI, which, of course, at that point in the book, uh, you know, all AI except for just institutionalized artificial intelligence is weak AI instead of strong AI. So, yeah, we've got... You know, technology now, for instance, just in the last year, Apple introduced Siri in your smartphone. Now, that's about as weak as AI can get, really, um, for a general application. But the fact is, people are adopting it, and they're using it. Um, you know, telephone systems are starting to become sort of autonomous. Uh, with the advent of Watson, you're starting to see that wanting to uh, go into the medical field. You're going to see that probably pervade call centers. Um you know, as that technology gets minimized or miniaturized and uh, peripherates out into different, uh, you know, areas of our lives, you know, into computers and technology, I think we're actually going to wind up creating a lot of, uh, uh, I hate to say the word subservient, but we're going to create a lot of different types of artificial intelligence um, that's going to interact with us on a daily basis. So, But does that mean that humanity would also become a program running on a chip somewhere? And why? Well... Well, now, that's, that's kind of the big question, then, um, whether you believe that, you know, the human mind is based on a, a computationalism model or whether you've got some other kind of um, dualist theory, you know, that the, the spirit and soul and, and the body are, are two separate things that can never actually be transferred into a software system. Uh, of course, the novel supports the, the computationalism as a, a dualism where your, your brain is more of a... Uh, you know, a hardware, a piece of hardware, which gets transferred over into the system, and then your mind itself is the, the operating software. So, you know, if you um, if you accept that theory, which is a pretty widely accepted theory of computationalism, then, you know, the possibility that one day we'll be able to actually uh, transfer consciousness and run a human mind in a digital form, you know, that, that becomes more plausible. Now, if you don't, don't buy into that theory, then, you know, it's... Uh, 
you know, a lot, uh, it probably won't ever happen. <laughs> okay, but, but let me ask you this then. Are there no benefits to biology? Because, you know, you're talking about immortality and, and all those things in your book, but perhaps we would be able to achieve immortality in other ways other than going digital. For example, through genetic engineering and so on, uh, synthetic biology, all kinds of nanotechnology and new drugs, which may allow us to survive indefinitely within our own physical, biological bodies. So are there no benefits to keeping the biology? Well, that's a really good question, too. Uh, from my point of view with biology, uh, and, and I, I think we very, very well may wind up with engineered body parts, uh, replacement parts, regenerative medicine is going to be huge. Um, I mean, we've already seen where they can start growing organs. Uh, you've got uh, artificial bladders now they can print. Exactly, and yeah. Some amazing stuff. Um, I definitely see life extension uh, as on the horizon. Now, whether you can sustain biology forever, I mean, that's, an, that's another question altogether. I mean, cells do wear out and can only replicate so many times. Mm -hmm. um, aside from that, though, if you look at the world at large, this Earth probably can't sustain a population that will live forever, um, especially if we reproduce. I mean, even at our, our current uh, population, I mean, we're already putting a strain on the environment. We're putting a strain on our resources, our ability to grow food. Um, you know, if you can take that human element and kind of convert that over into a, a digital form, it, it takes that burden off of the system. So, so you think bunch, digital humans have a much smaller footprint on the environment than biological well, ones? Extraordinarily small. I mean, it's a smaller footprint than your cell phone. Um, you know, think of how many of those you could put in a football field. So, yeah, I mean... Just from an environmental standpoint, I mean, you can continue the human race and, and continue that population growth and continue life and quality of life will accelerate. I mean, in biology, biological form, I mean, we still have pain. We still have, you know, some misery that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can still die from an accident, I mean, even if your body's conditioned to live forever. So, I mean, there's a lot of advantages. Of course, you know, there are disadvantages, too, to, to a non-corporeal life. I mean, so some of that's debated in the book. Uh, yes. Quite a bit. Now the protagonist, he's um, he's fairly resistive to the idea initially. Uh, he wants to live out his life as he's always lived it, and uh, like most people in his generation, it's more of a retirement plan. It's a kind of an oh well, you know, that's the way we're going to go. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, from his perspective, after the change happens, it's more miraculous or positive in his view. And from then on out, the case is kind of made that that's the way to go. Um, now, that's not to say everybody's experience would be that way or, or people would even want it. But, um, you know, you have to have that choice, too, I think. Now, let me, since you mentioned the protagonist, let me ask you, are you, where's the name of the protagonist coming from? His name is William Samuel Babington. Yes. Is that an said. accident or is, is that done for a reason? I let my wife pick that out, actually. <laughs> she picked the name? She picked the name, yeah. Oh, I, I think it's a good choice. Yeah. Um, so, Tracy, let me ask you this then. What's the general goal of the book? What do you want to accomplish with it? Well, the book itself, um, you know, I want to have a few different uh, perspectives to come out of that for people. I, I want to write something that's entertaining that people will enjoy, uh, obviously. Um, I also want to write something that is um, kind of counter to the dystopian trends that we're seeing uh, in fiction and have for the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything that's come out is, is some kind of apocalyptic vision or um, there's some kind of oppressive, you know, overtone or, you know, technology, AI is evil or bad. So I, I kind of want to buck that trend. So I want to put a, a positive experience out there. And on top of that, I'd really like to uh, write something that's relatable. Uh, I wanted a term ready to be something that uh, people like you and I that are really into the singularity, we're really into the technology, something that we would get and enjoy, mm -hmm. but something that the average person off the street could pick up and read and kind of understand and get introduced to a lot of the concepts yeah. that are floating out there. Because... I mean, if you think about it, 
you've got researchers. There's probably what a couple hundred thousand researchers that are working on neural science, artificial intelligence, computer science, uh, and then they write a lot of white papers. They they write a lot of um, articles. You know, the people like uh, you and I tend to get into, and the audience that watches Singularity One on One. You know, that audience is fairly broad. You know, you know maybe three. Five million people probably are really into the technology and the singularity and know what it is. But 99.95% of the Earth's population doesn't know anything about it at all. I mean, there's really kind of, um, I don't know, kind of a lack there. I mean, people don't really have a clue. A lot of those, those folks tend to only get their um, information from their entertainment, mm-hmm. be it something they watch on the Discovery Channel or a science fiction television show or a book they read. So yeah. I wanted to write something that would introduce a lot of those concepts, especially the more positive aspects, to a broad audience. So that's one of the goals I really want to put out there, something mm-hmm. that's related for everyone. And how do you know if you've succeeded or not? <laughs> well, that that, uh, that that I guess we'll find out uh, as the weeks and months come through, and if uh, people give me the right kind of feedback on the book, or at least you know positive feedback. So, um, well, as far as I'm concerned, I have to say that I I think that you have succeeded in sort of making the ideas very accessible to the average person and and making it also very relatable and pleasant to read and entertaining. So I personally enjoyed it. Um, but let me go back to the moment where you mentioned that Frankenstein was another book that was written in the same format that your, your book is written in. But obviously Frankenstein would fall in the sort of dystopian, perhaps, world where, yep. you know, a, a brilliant scientist creates something which ends up killing him. Uh, so do you think that uh, science fiction has been overall pretty dystopian and negative ever since Frankenstein? And uh, and then, in contrast to that, do you think that your book is kind of utopian at the other end of the spectrum? Oh, it absolutely is utopian at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, that's that was one of the primary goals when I wrote the book. I wanted to have a positive but hopefully realistic view of uh, you know one possible scenario. But yeah, uh, dystopia is definitely uh, attractive. Um, it's attractive in the fact that you can get a lot of drama out of dystopia very easily. Uh, you know, anytime you write something that's a bad situation, you've got a lot of room there to easily write, um, you know, write your drama to get your characters into situations, uh, to have that shock factor. So it, it's fairly easy to write dystopia um, compared to a more utopian type novel where you're trying to tackle problems and society is, is the problem mm-hmm. sometimes. Um you know, I totally agree with that view. I thought that writing something negative is always easier than writing something positive, no matter what it is, whether it's a review or, or a novel that's dystopian versus a utopian one. But Cory Doctorow, whom I interviewed on my podcast, and who is, by the way, one of my all-time favorite science fiction writers, he disagreed with me terribly on that one. <laughs> well, you know, I guess everybody's got uh, got their opinions. I think uh, I think Corey's very intelligent, and I think he's got some fantastic work out there. Um, you know, I, I enjoy what he does and what he has to say. But you know, um, in my corner of the world, I think uh, I think we need a little bit of um, a little bit of positive and a little bit of utopia. <clears throat> Society's kind of I don't know. I mean, we, we seem to be in a really low point or a stressful point right now in the world. I mean, there's all sorts of bad stuff going on everywhere. And, um, you know, a lot of people on a personal level, I think, are kind of hurting. Um, and, and really, you know, fiction can be an escape from that, even if it's just for a little while. And, you know, I really wanted to, to write something where, you know, if you're in a bad place or if you've, uh, you know, you're kind of down with everything that's going down, I just... Uh, I wanted you to be able to read something just for a couple hours to take a break from that mm-hmm. that trauma of real life and uh, the way the world is and uh, maybe feel a little bit better about the future. I mean, that's that's kind of the goal of Utopia, to make you feel a little bit better when you get to the end of it. So And perhaps to motivate you to actually turn some of that fiction into reality. Well, that's that's a very good point. I mean, that was the Star Trek effect, uh, to go back to that and what Gene Roddenberry did. You know, he had an overall vision, and, uh, you know, people were really 
harsh towards him uh, when he came out with Star Trek. Uh, you know, multiracial ship, you know, women in command, yeah. you know, all these different uh, visions of a better future where everybody's got an equal slice of the pie. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was he was definitely put down, but sometimes you got to have that positive uh, positive vision. And sometimes people will take that and make a template out of it like they have with Star Trek. I mean, it's inspired a lot of technology. It's changed the way people view uh, view the world. I mean, it's just a – it's one little tiny brick and piece in the in – the, you know, trying to build a, a better world. But, you know, I mean, you've got to have those, those bricks and pieces to do that. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm so pretentious to think my book's going to be one of those bricks or pieces, but I, <laughs> I, I definitely want to try to contribute uh, a, a grain of sand to the mortar, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so let me grab another thought that I actually quite liked uh, in your book, uh, which is uh, taken from page 120, where you say that, the Second Renaissance, as it came to be known, was a period when every person alive could do more than any previous generation and contribute to the betterment of society. Mm -hmm. So how far do you think we are from that point? Are, are we close? Are we there? Are we not there yet? I think it depends on your worldview. I mean, if you look now, right now, every person has more knowledge in their pocket than any other point in history. I mean, you can whip out your smartphone and you've got the entirety, almost the entire human knowledge in your hand. You've got the ability to record events and video or take pictures. You've got GPS location to where you can see exactly where you're at on the planet. You can interact with people. You can talk to people, make calls. You can even write a book on your smartphone if you want and, and try to change the world that way. So people are extraordinarily empowered today. And I think that, that as technology progresses on, that empowerment is going to increase dramatically, even exponentially. So when you start to shed some of the, the things that, that hold people back, um, especially if you get into, in the book, uh, kind of a, a, an abundance state where – you know, people aren't worrying about the petty things in life. You're not worrying about survival. You're not worrying about food, where you're going to sleep, your health. You know, you start to take away those things that hold people back or distract them or keep them from really meeting their potential or excelling or, or, or making that difference. Then you start to free people up to, to really make a difference and change things. And, um, you know, the technology that, that will empower that, uh, you know, will amplify that effect further. So I think... <clears throat> we're getting closer, and you know, if we can reach a, a state where we're in uh, a post-scarcity state, and with our advanced technology, I think that's going to give people a uh, a lot more room to to grow uh, individually and, and to make contributions as they as they want and see fit. So I think that's a, a very positive thing. Let me grab another thought that you just mentioned right there, because it connects to another passage that I really found interesting in the book. And that's coming straight from page 79, where you said, As I had always believed, people are intrinsically good. When the burdens of life are gone, that good comes out in the art, style, and air of happiness that made the city what it was, joy in structure. So, so someone would say that human nature is, you know, intrinsically bad, greedy, and selfish. And the world that we live in is a reflection of that. Look around, you know, we have murder, theft, wars have been a constant, you know, phenomenon since the very early days of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone would say, well, nothing would change. That would, those elements of, of our life would never go extinct because they're part of human nature. And yet you believe that they're not. Well, human nature on an individual basis probably won't change very much. Um, I think that, you know, we have a lot of, um, I mean, there's a lot of evolution of biology behind, you know, the way that we behave and the things we do. But the majority of the negative behavior that we see, I think, is driven by um, fulfilling just the base needs. I mean, we... We have needs for, uh, you know, food. We have need for water, shelter. Um, you know, we seek 
seeking status. So a lot of greed comes with, uh, you know, looking for status or to uh, increase your material wealth, which makes you more attractive. Um, so on an individual basis, I mean, when you start talking about a, uh, a post-scarcity type society where um, wealth basically becomes irrelevant, uh, especially in a digital form, because essentially, you know, there is no economy um, other than just, just what you do for other people. I, I think you can start to see the percentage of uh, people that, that are necessarily bad or bad nature will start to go away quite a bit. Now, on a society level as a whole, I think we do have quite a bit of room to change. Uh, um, you know, everything we've got as, you know, a nation state, our attitudes, um, you know, the reasons why we go to war, I mean, a lot of those things are uh, driven by, you know, need for resources, need to expand land, or, you know, of course, the other part of that's ideology, which we can we can talk about. But if you start to take away some of those, those physical needs, the needs for resources, and you start to look at a situation where population may actually start to decline, especially if you introduce uh, an element like in the book where you've got uh, the ability to transcend biology to, to escape um, some of the, the more miserable parts of life. Um, I think you'll find, you know, we can kind of evolve our societies to not have some of those more negative attributes. Now, they'll still be there. Um, even in the book, I mean, there there comes a need for a justice system uh, in Eternum, uh, you know, where the, the character Ray kind of give, uh, gave humanity just a little bit too much credit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're always going to deal with the criminal element. Um, but some of the motivations for that and some of the reasons why people do behave that way, I think, uh can eventually go away in certain circumstances, especially in a post-scarcity state. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the ways that you actually work around that issue, I think, is that um, you kind of make the, the AI sort of very benevolent, but at the same time very almighty and omnipotent <laughs> uh, and, in a way, indestructible in, in the real world. Right. Uh, so... How is that? How is that connect with the article that you wrote in in on, on Singularity Weblog, where you say that it is very possible that artificial intelligence may be all those things except interested in humanity. Yeah, how do you reconcile uh, those two views? <laughs> well, the thing about it is, I mean. In the book, I try to take the positive path. I mean, there, there's an infinite number of paths before us, especially when it comes to creating artificial life. So, I mean, uh, the article I wrote was more of a, um, a way to get people to stop thinking in kind of a binary good-bad. I mean, that's, you know, when you're talking about intelligent beings, I mean, look at human beings. There's not really just good people or bad people. I mean, we're everywhere in between. So. Um, the article is kind of uh, trying to expand the, the conversation to say, look, you know, uh, artificial intelligence may very well be the other way. I mean, it may not even be interested in human beings at all. Now, in the novel setting, of course, to try to go with the theme of optimism, um, I try to pursue more of the, the positive aspects of artificial intelligence. So, uh, you know, all the media, the Terminator, all the things that you've seen, the Matrix, I mean, it's all bad artificial intelligence. So. So in that regard, yeah, I'm trying to explore that uh, that particular um, that particular path. But yeah, I mean, it's true. There could be all sorts of other uh, dispositions for artificial intelligence, uh, especially hyper intelligence. Yeah, and, and there's also other alternatives that could lead to conflict. By the way, um, mm -hmm. for example, putting aside the fact that artificial intelligence may hate us and decide to exterminate us, like in the Terminator, or maybe just, uh, you know, totally uninterested in us and we can just be one of the sort of side effects. Us going extinction may be one of the side effects simply because it's more interested in other things uh, and it might require the, our atoms to build other stuff, for example. Uh, but uh, Hugo de Garis, Professor Hugo de Garis, whom I interviewed for this show, says that one of the more likely ways is that humanity would actually be divided into what he calls Terrans and Cosmists, or people who are pro-artificial intelligence and enhancement and transcending biology, and people who are anti. So do you not think that before we actually get to the point where Artificial intelligence becomes eternal, becomes eternal, becomes omnipotent and indestructible. Mm 
before that point, it can actually be attacked and destroyed in a sort of a global war between those two fractions of humanity. Why build it in the first place? I guess would be the first first question if you know you're that, that concerned about the existential risk. So, well, let's say I am willing to take such risk, but let's say you have other ideological agenda, which says uh, our destiny is biology. God created us biological, and if He wanted us to be digital, He would have created us digital, and therefore what you're doing it is wrong. And you're risking not only the wrath of God, but, of God, but you're also risking the, the annihilation of humanity in general. And even if that's a very low probability to occur, the risk is so enormous that it's not worth taking. And therefore, I am uh, you might be willing to undergo and undo any any actions uh, to 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 do any actions that would prevent me from doing so, from a creating artificial intelligence, even if that leads, you know, to my destruction and, you know, m even million other people's deaths, because your calculation would be that you're saving humanity in general as a race, and therefore that would be a price worth paying. So you wouldn't hesitate to use nuclear weapons or biological or other weapons of mass destruction if need be. Yeah, well, actually, the same argument uh, is made for uh, nuclear technology, too, today. I mean, right now, there's, uh, of course, a lot to do with Iran and, you know, their peaceful nuclear program versus a nuclear weapon program. I mean, um, you know, there's always going to be conflict and debate. Um, you know, in the book, the technology kind of sneaks up on people. I mean, it's yeah. seen as a commercial application. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of that's going to change as we get closer to artificial intelligence, too. I think um, right now, if you said you wanted to create a all-powerful artificial intelligence, super intelligence with, you know, unlimited capacity for thought, I mean, you're, you're definitely going to hit that brick wall of, of people and ideology. But, um, you know, as our society starts to develop more and more artificial intelligence, and becomes more integrated with it. I mean, you're going to start to see commercial drivers demand that technology. Um, people will start to see and use it in different ways, and I think acceptance will will start to come about uh, that way. Now, that's not to say there won't be you know people that are hard line against. It. I mean, there always is, and just about any kind of social movement or technological advancement. I mean, uh, we still got a, a pretty sizable population of Amish that. Uh, you know, don't care much for electricity. I mean, you know, so that's that's always going to be there. I don't think they've ever taken up arms against the power company, though. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's something we're definitely going to have to, uh, to face as a society, um, you know, inside or outside of uh, fiction. I mean, our, our media is definitely going to sway some of the argument. Um, you, you know, another person, another proponent of that idea is, uh, by the way, Richard Clark. Uh, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, uh, Military Affairs and then a member of the National Security Council of uh, President George Bush. Uh, and then he was, you know, Special Advisor for Cyberspace Security and so on. He wrote a book a few years ago called uh, Breakpoint. And, and, and he argues kind of like, um, you know, that this is a very high probability, at least in his, in his book, in his estimate, now, in your book, you resolve that issue by letting the technological singularity sort of sneak up on us in a sort of a fast takeoff where, you know, humanity is basically taken by surprise by how powerful and indestructible Ray has become. Mm -hmm. And another way that you resolve this potential conflict is the fact that you still allow for people who are un uninterested in technology and transcending into the digital realm uh, to continue existing exactly the way they have been existing uh, long before. So on page 259, for example, you talk about the Amish, where you say, the technology avoiding Amish didn't even notice or care about the events of the last hundred years. It was all so silly to them, patches, eternum, and starships. As much as things change, some things never change. So you think that it is possible that you know, we would have digital augmented beings who have transcended biology and people like the Amish peacefully coexisting side by side? Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have our current technological people uh, today walking around uh, with the Amish kind of intermingled in society. Um, 
you know, I, I see that as a, a huge possibility. I mean, we still have people that are Stone Age level existence uh, on Earth. I mean, we kind of segregate ourselves a little bit uh, from those populations. Of course, we uh, we kind of act like we're doing them a favor by protecting them from us. So I don't know. I mean, if we, if we are or not, but uh, you know, I mean, I think uh, I think there's definitely room for people to have freedom of choice, and I think that's going to be the key thing is is to allow people to choose what they want for themselves instead of forcing something uh, on them. I mean, if it's artificial intelligence, if it's transhumanism, uh, it, it's got to be in a way that people will want it for themselves, not that they have to. Um, and I, that's true of any technology, really. I, I mean, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you don't have to go, go buy the latest and greatest of anything. You can, you can live your life as you want or, uh, or be a Luddite and, and not. Um, you know, freedom of choice is going to be critical, and especially when it comes to artificial intelligence in the future. I mean, if you don't want to interact with that, I think there will definitely be societal niches um, that will probably spring up around not having to deal with technology, just like the Amish, uh, for example. Speaking uh, about uh, uh, things that you think would never change, let me ask you this. Uh, do you think that, techno that uh, the family as a Basic, basic social unit would not change in in this in that circumstance of us transcending biology, and why not? Because I mean, if everything else is changing, if governments change in their nature, religions, and everything that we've known of of us so far as a species, in terms of our social units and so on, wouldn't that also mean that the family would change and perhaps go obsolete? Well, I don't think. Human pair bonding is ever going to go obsolete. I mean, we always seem to want to seek out other people, be it friends, family. Um, I, I think the choice to choose how you build your family uh, should always be there. Um, I think that the definition of a family will definitely change. I mean, especially if you get into a, 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 a digital life uh, where things even like gender don't really even kind of come into play where you can shift parents' gender. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think people are still going to seek out other people to form bonds with, uh, potentially, you know, have children with. Um, you know, it's going to be up to the individual what they want to do. You know, if you don't ever want to get married, then then don't. You know, um, if if you want to form a different kind of family unit, uh, you know, if you have a large group of people that want to in the future, maybe that that'll be you know their choice. So I think again, we come back around to individual choice becomes very important. Um, and especially as things start to change and we start to be able to, to kind of change who we are a little bit um, on the outside, I think uh, allowing freedom and choice on the inside is going to be very important uh, to what makes you happy as a person. So, Tracy, uh, we're kind of getting towards the end of, of our interview here, and I have uh, about three or four questions left here. But uh, let me ask you this. Um, from our preliminary conversation, I know that uh, it took you only two years uh, or less, actually, between uh, getting inspired from watching Transcendent Men and actually your book uh, being published. Uh, so let me ask you this. Um, do you have any other plans for another book or another task like that? What's next for Tracy Atkins? Uh, I definitely have a lot of ideas. Is uh, for a lot of books. Um, you know, I kind of want to. I've been actually tossing around quite a few, but uh, some are kind of a continuation of this story. Uh, I've got some other things I really want to tell and kind of tackle in the, the singularity um, mm -hmm. genre, which is is kind of a, a versioning genre, really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess for me, um, you know, I want to continue to write. Uh, I want to continue to write op-ed pieces. Uh, also to kind of talk about more of the um, the nonfiction side of this. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I've really enjoyed the conversation I've had with people, uh, the interaction, the feedback, and, and the discussion. I mean, it's been just overwhelmingly, uh, I guess, intellectual and mind-blowing. I've, I've gotten from a lot of people. So. Yeah, I have to say, I, my impression is exactly the same. I found, you know, my interaction with readers on Singularity Weblog and, and on Singularity One-on-One, -on -one too, absolutely perhaps not perhaps but easily the most rewarding part because it's very enriching yeah definitely um, I feel like I uh, kind of uh, I don't know how to put it I uh, 
feel like I kind of belong. You know what I mean? That's it's mm-hmm. it, you know, where's all this been all my life? <laughs> it is a community. It it is a community, and it is growing, and and it is uh, it has very pro- many proactive people in it. So so it, that's fantastic, and I think uh, it's 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 a community with future huge future potential that's going to grow immensely, exponentially. I I hope, <laughs> and I believe also. But well, let yeah. me ask you this then. So for people who want to find out more information about you and your work, what's the best place to do so? Uh, my author blog is uh, usually where I keep all my information up to date uh, about the books I've uh, written. I'm going to be writing um, all the different articles and things. So TracyRAtkins.com, uh, yeah, easy to find. Mm-hmm. I've also got for Turnham Ray, I've got a TurnhamRay.com as a micro site too, where you can see the trailer and kind of look a little bit of more information, read the prologues. So mm-hmm. Got yeah. out there, that out there. So, but uh, yeah, my author blog definitely. Yeah, I would actually attach the trailer and some of the, some of those other things to oh, to, okay. to the interview. Um, but the last question that I always ask of my guests on the show is always the same, and that is. If our viewers and listeners could take a single point from you today, what would you like that to be? The single most important thing, in your view? I think I think it's kind of a a, a request in a way. I uh, I think I would like to see if people would consider that the people alive today. Imagine in a, a singularity situation where everyone today continues on. Uh, living forever, you know, to all the generations that are around today, um, you know, this this future is out there. So it, the future you want um, may require, you know, some changes in the way people think. Um, I, I think it would be unwise to wait for some future epoch or some future event to start changing the future. So start thinking about the people around you today and how you can enrich their lives and uh, try to make the world a better place now, and, and don't try to wait for the singularity or or something um, something to happen. I mean, today's the day to really start. So don't wait for the singularity. Change the world for the better today. Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. I think it's a good place to end, too. <laughs> I appreciate so, it. Tracy. Thank you very much for spending almost an, an hour with us today on Singularity One on One. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I, I definitely have been looking forward to it, and I'm, I'm really glad uh, we got to have this talk. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you for all the wonderful work you do too with the uh, Singularity Weblog and all the One on Ones. I mean, it's extraordinarily valuable, and I've enjoyed them immensely. So, so please continue to do that, and I thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah.